we are now moving from here to, to the end of the semester, we're in the home stretch, but we're also going to be covering one of the most important sections of the course. You've got the biology down, you now have non-chemical methods, okay, and hopefully I'll get, you know, your corrected prelims too soon to you. We now move into this last section. From now on, that's what your prelim three or your final exam will be. And at some point, I won't do it today since we're missing a few people, I'd like to ask the group and, and see if right now the final is set for like December 18th, like pretty well the last day. Um, so what I want to do is ask the class if there might be a, a date before, if, you know, if there's one individual that can't, I can give it to them on the 18th. But if most of the class can do it a day, you know, a couple of days before and you're in agreement, I'm, I'm open to that, okay? So just keep, you might want to look at your schedules and say, you know, if, if mo a lot of people can't, I'm not going to move it just because it's going to be just, just a mess, okay? Um, but this section is going to be now, you know, you started the labs, we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll, the two of them will parallel each other. We'll be talking about modes of action in, the, in, in lab, but actually seeing the stuff in here, it's more the theory, the background information, okay? To me, this is where you separate now. Even the folks that have practical herbicide experience, what, based on my experience, as soon as I start, you know, basically... Uh, removing the surface, asking questions about how does the herbicide work, what does it do, mode of action, uh, that's where you lose some of these the students or folks that think they know. Uh, they might know how much product to use and what it controls, but how it works and what might be an issue with the product, uh, given you know, different environmental conditions, very often that knowledge is not there. And there, that's where we also separate kind of folks that have gone more through a tech, technology education through more of the science base so that this no matter what chemical is going to come out in the future you have a good sound understanding of the basic principle so that's what I'm going to try to do and we'll, we'll supplement this in class recognize that 95 percent of agriculture at least crop production uses makes use of herbicides so no more than five percent is organic not to say that that's not increasing on the way out so you cannot dismiss this in saying well you know I'm, I'm organic it, this doesn't I don't, you know, I don't want to know about this, or, you know, I'm from front back, and I know all this, because there's something there for everybody. So be, be open-minded about this. Um, and so what we'll do today is talk a little bit about an introduction to herbicides. The Ross and Lemby book, the 2007 version, there are a couple of copies on reserve in the library, really does a good job with this. A lot of my material comes from there. So if some of this is, mm, I, geez, I need to grasp this a little better, and the notes you find, I, I'd like to read more, that would... That's where I think the textbook really comes in handy. Up to now, you may not have you know, really needed it, but I think this, that would be definitely, so make a note of that. And I want to talk a little bit about the history or classification of, of herbicides. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is if any of you at some point need information on herbicides, this is pretty well the Bible of, of anything herbicides. It's put out by the Wheat Science Society every like four or five years, there's a new Volume. This is the ninth edition, 2007 edition. This gives you everything you need to know. Toxicity information, trade names, impacts, what it affects, and so forth. Okay? If any of you are interested, it's $95. It's not cheap. It's probably the best thing you could ever buy if you, you're in that area. You know, if you're going to be working as a consultant, this is what reps and people use. You know, because it's, 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 it's science-based. It's got all the information in there. It's color-coded by mode of action and so forth, okay? If you'd like to, to get a copy, all you have to do is in, uh, go to the website of the Wheat Science Society of America, WSSA, okay, dot org. And under, uh, I think, a bookstore, you'll see this, okay? But if you want to know structures, again, for some of you, this is maybe way beyond what you'll need. But some of you are going to be in, in industry or consulting, and you need this. Um, just wanted to let you know that it's there. Certainly not a requirement for the course. Um, I'll provide you that information. But if you want to know where do I get some of this stuff or I like a copy of my own, that's, that's a good, good way to do it. Okay? Yes, maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. That's a good point. Take a, look. Take a look at that if that's of interest. Okay. So hopefully the notes are there. Whenever I talk about this section, I'm going to have some folks in here that I'll call the nozzle heads and eco-freaks. John, John Losey, some of you in the IPM course know, remember we had that debate at the beginning of the year, okay? Um, what I say to this, no and no, be open-minded, okay? Those of you who are more of, you know, yes, we've used these products, 
They're the best thing that could ever happen. Uh, my father told me, or my grandfather told me, you could drink glyphosate. No. And those of you that are going to tell me that glyphosate causes cancer to everybody who uses it, or 2,4-D, the answer is no. Somewhere in between, let the science speak. I'll leave it up to you. I'm not going to try to change any of your perceptions or ideas. I just want to show you what the science says. Okay? And so if you're going to work in this area and you know you're going to be using herbicides, definitely, you know, pick up information. Those of you who, you know, realize, well, I, I probably, I want to know about it. I'm not likely to be using it. That's fine, too. Be well informed so that if you, even if you get into a discussion, you could discuss the information in an intelligent way and it's not just hearsay. It's actual, you know, makes sense what you're doing, okay? So I usually, this is my disclaimer because I know, oh, I don't want to know about this, okay? So, um, again, not, uh, all of this is kind of somewhere in the notes. It's not in the, in, all in the perfect order, but some of this is just so general that I, I thought you could, we could just kind of take a look at that. When did herbicides really take off? Okay, well, the kind of herbicides we're using now, synthetic herbicides, basically during World War II, uh, right after World War II in 1940s, okay, a uh, herbicide, the first synthetic herbicide was something called 2,4-D, and we'll talk more about what this 2,4-D is. Okay, very important, um, you know, period, and then basically you're to the point now where you have close to 200, okay, compounds that are on the market. And if you count the premixes that they have, they mix compounds, different herbicides, and, and you know, basically market them as, 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 as new products, then that number probably doubles, okay? So it's a lot of herbicides. You can't possibly know all these herbs, especially in this course. We're going to focus in maybe on 15, 20 of the most common, most important herbicides that you'd likely come across and learn a bit about them. And they're all into different categories, modes of action, to give you an idea of what they are. Okay? I cannot ask you, tell me the symptoms of these 200. But once you know a few key ones in each of the groups, you can go anywhere and say, it's like saying, I don't know what that weed is, but I, boy, it's got the same characteristics as the, as the, you know, the smart weeds. It's probably a polygonaceae, but I don't know what the, and this is the same thing. I don't know what that specific herbicide is, but boy, based on the symptomology, the fact that it leaves, the broadleaf weeds are affected, the grasses are not, and it's this twisting, bending, that's going to be what we call a phenoxy type herbicide, a 2,4-D lookalike. Okay, that's already big. You already have, you know, removed 90% of the herbicides. That's what I'm hoping that you'll get out of this, okay, that you could do that. And for some, you'll hit them right on the nail because the symptomology is pretty clear, okay? Uh, boy, the adoption of herbicides has been incredible since the 40s. Uh, before the advent of transgenic crops, Roundup Ready, you know, soybeans and stuff, I would always say there has been no technology that has been ado adopted in, in the quantity and the speed, like in this case, herbicides, but the, similarly for insecticides and fungicides. I mean, you know, basically since World War II, I mean, this is 95% of ag, at least in developed countries, is making use of, of herbicides, okay? Um, but now with you know, transgenics, the adoption in the last 15 years, that has surpassed how fast people adopted uh, herbicides, but of course, that's also part of what transgenics are all about. Roundup Ready, I mean, it's a herbicide. There is, the, I, as I told you, it's not by mistake that Monsanto and Syngenta, the big companies, the first transgenic crops they were looking at were for herbicide control because, as I told you, most of the money in control of pests goes towards weed control. Okay? It is not insects. It is not path. Not that they're not important. Again, don't get me wrong. You're, you're you know, you've got a vineyard Diseases are a big issue, okay? But in general, if you look at cross crop production, it's by far most of the money is spent for control of weeds. And so they saw an opportunity, industry and private industries, those companies saw an opportunity. Boy, if we could put something in there, wouldn't most growers would love to have this stuff? And that's what happened. So 95, 97% of soybean, in the, in, at least in New York State, is Roundup Ready. That's, that's amazing technology, okay? And that's why, you know, again, the numbers are, are a little dated here. I'm not really concerned. I, I was trying to get more, you know, very, it's very similar. It has not changed. In fact, it's increased because of the use of Roundup. It's gone up. Okay, we'll talk more about that. Okay? This, remember this famous, okay, slide is just showing you the, the time frame that we're at, okay? Uh, 1947, 
It's this period here that we're, we're now see the introduction. Selective chemical control introduced. So mid-40s. And by the way, 2,4-D, this herbicide that I talked to you about, do you know what the, it, it actually was not developed to be a herbicide. Do you know what it was actually developed for? To be what? Actually an insecticide, okay? Remember, after World War II, all these chemists and these folks were working, were working, you know, for the war effort. And after when the war was over, you had all this expertise, these products that they were, you know, looking for chemical warfare, bear, basically. They put, they, they kind of changed their, you know, the, the, the mode of uh, not action of how they operate to say, hey, can we make use of any of these products you guys have developed during the war that may be helpful for agriculture? That's how it started. Some of these products were like in the back rooms of some labs and stuff. And they said, oh, wow, this works. 2,4-D was, was actually, they were looking at it as an insecticide and then realized, boy, it's got some nice properties of controlling uh, broadleaf weeds, okay? So, you know, we're here in the 80s, but this is, you know, way here, okay? So we do definitely, the mechanical control is still important. Herbicide, a little bit of, uh, then again, this is focused on the U.S. Obviously, internationally, if you're in a developing country, there's, there's much more of this, but it's, it's on the move. Okay, even in developed countries. So 1940s or so is really when, when, when we start seeing first synthetic herbicides. Okay? I will get you this slide. I, I put this together before I, uh, right after I had put that together. So I'll give you this slide just because it gives you some why herbicides are so widely used. I mean, you can't, you know, you've got to, you know, as much as some, some folks might be against them, boy, they work. In general, they do work. Okay, rapid effective reliable weed control in, in the time period you want. I mean, you will see some herbicides in lab that within one hour of spraying, an example here would be paraquat. I mean, the plant's gone. A couple hours, you start seeing it. Just, just you know, others will take a little longer. Uh, residual activity. Wow, you know, I don't have to go in and cultivate every three, three days. I could put a herbicide down that will give me season-long control. You know, you don't want to have it too long because maybe there'll be a problem for next year if you're rotating crops. But, man, is it nice to just put that herbicide down and something like a dual or metallochlor and not have to worry till about harvest time. You know, it'll keep all the weeds from emerging. I mean, you can't, you can't go wrong there. Control of weeds where inter-row cultivation is impossible. You can't get sometimes too close. Uh, especially when the crop is a little large, it's nice to be able to go in and put a herbicide down or banding just like you band a furlough, you can band just right over the, the crop row, because you can cultivate between rows. But it's right in that, that row where you've got to go hand, you know. And so that's, that's, been, that's always been, a, been an issue, and you could do it with herbicide. Narrow row spacing, you can't get equipment in there. But boy, you can certainly spray, you know. And that, that's helpful. Uh, sod crops, important. No-till. The only reason people can do no-till is that you have herbicides that are effective. And the good example would be something like Roundup, okay, and other herbicides. So as no-till went up in the 70s, right after glyphosate came onto the market, no-till no acreage increased substantially in the United. Before that, they couldn't do it, because how do you control the weeds if you do no-till? Cultivation was the, a major way to do it. So herbicides allowed, okay, and reduced reliance on tillage allowed this. So keep that in mind. So you're trying to conserve soil, by reducing tillage, but you also have to use more herbicides. Okay, so that's something to think about. Reduce fuel costs because of, of uh, re reduction in tillage. Uh, the other thing is, how do you control weeds that you can't economically control in any other way? Perennial, creeping perennials are tough. How many growers can afford to put a whole field in, in, in you know, fallow? And you saw that in prelim too, you know, that, that, that clear fallow type situation where you're not using the land, especially if you, your land is very valuable and, or you don't have much of it and you've got to use it every year and make sure you can't do that. Herbicides allow you to do that. You can spray and we'll talk about some of these herbicides are what we call systemic. You apply them to the leaves and they move through the xylem and the phloem to, particularly in the phloem in this case, to areas that, you know, what we call sinks in the plants where the plant stores its energy. Oh, you can kill those rhizomes or tubers, that's, okay, cultivation can, can chop them up, okay, uh, but then you might have to do that on a repeated basis. So, so very, very important. Late emerging weeds, what do you do? You can't get in with a cultivator sometimes. Maybe the weeds are too big, and even if you could get in, the cultivation is not going to kill them. Remember that video that you saw on toes? The guy says, well, you know, if, if you've got your pigweed that's six inches, seven inches, you're in trouble. 
Well, herbicides can do the job. It doesn't really matter. I mean, there's, and some of them are stage um, specific, but most often that's not a, not a big deal, okay? You can, you can control late emerging weeds. Control weeds and turf, pasture, aquatic systems. I mean, geez, you know, I mean, in turf, sometimes you're controlling grasses in turf. And you do that. How do you control crabgrass? That's why Scott's got that beautiful, in the springtime, they'll, they'll sell, you know, weed and feed, but then they say gra crabgrass and grub control in turf, you know, poor fescues. That's amazing that you have that selectivity to remove the panicum or the digitaria and not touch the poas and stuff. So that's why a lot of people use them, okay? Greater flexibility in weed management, general farm management decisions, okay? Uh, you don't have to spend hours and hours. You spray, you can put it away, especially for our dairy farmers, okay, that have a lot of, you know, they got to worry about their animals, their livestock, and, you know, I'll do it to a crop production person. This is critical. They've got other things that they need to worry about, okay? And again, avoidance of fallow periods for, for perennial weed control, what I just told you. The land can be used. You spray, pre-plant, you know, burn down of Roundup, boom, you're ready to go in. You don't have to, oh, my God, I've got uh, things like field bindweed and hedge bindweed, all these perennial, deep-rooted. What am I going to do? I have to, you know, cultivate um, throughout the summer, put that piece of land to the side. With herbicides, if, if you used properly and so forth, you could do that, okay? Avoidance of tillage, and again, opportunity to develop no-till or conservation tillage systems. They were possible because of herbicides. Otherwise, these systems do not, I mean, it's gonna be difficult. Not that it can't be done, but it's gonna be difficult. Okay, what about limitations? Even without looking at the list, throw some Im limitations out. What would be some problems? Cost, what else? Of herbicides. For those of you, kind of, ah, there's issues. Resistance. resistance development. Carryover, residuality problems. Uh, okay, you need the equipment. Environment. Environmental issues, big, big issues. I mean, you know, I'm not, so there are issues there too. And that's why it's not like, although 95% of most growers that you'll talk to, if they could be weaned off that, they would. Uh, but it's still, there's, there's issues. And part of it is, is, is some of these. Injury to non-targets, we'll talk about. Drift or other off-target issues. You're spraying uh, something called, you know, dicamba, banvel on, uh, you know, corn. It drifts over to uh, soybean, kills the soybean. That happens, okay? You don't calibrate your sprayer properly. That's why it was so important in these labs this week. How many times do I get to fields and somebody didn't calibrate properly? Or, not, you know, their, their nozzles were... You know, two of them were working properly. The other was either putting too much out, the, the, the uh, flow rate was too high or not high enough, okay? Crop injury, okay, through lack of selectivity. And that's what happens. You put too much of a herbicide in, too much, you will kill everything. You lose selectivity. You don't put enough, nothing's killed, okay? So very, very important because these products are tremendously selective, some of them. I mean, you'll, you'll see in lab. You're, you're looking, I can't believe it. You know, the grass is gone, and we'll have a number of, Kathy's done a great job of planting all these different crops in, in these flats, and we'll put a herbicide down, and you say, I can't believe it, the foxtails are there, the barnyard grass is there, the poa's there, and man, look at the broad, velvet leaf gone, lamb are gone. Just, wow, you know, how the hell is, are they doing this? I mean, that's, that's, that's impressive. The whole residue carryover from one season to the other. If you have a product that stays too long in the soil, you might say, well, that's good for a growing season, but you don't want it there the next year because say you're moving, you're rotating from corn and now you're going to be in soybean and you've got things like atrazine, which is one of the most important corn herbicides, still there in the soil, it'll kill your soybean crop. I mean, you're talking hundreds of acres, if not thousands of acres. It's happened. So you need to do some bioassays, but also you need to use the products under the right conditions. And they, they'll tell you when you're more likely to get residual issues. For example, in atrazine, when it's, it's, it's cool and dry, uh, when the product is applied, that kind of soil that you have, soil properties, okay? So, now, herbicides are not, you know, perfect. Just like biocontrol agents and stuff, they are also prone to poor efficacy or crop injury when you have environmental conditions that are not right. You do not spray a herbicide when it's 95 degrees and the crop is stressed, water stressed, or it's too cold because you're going to be asking for trouble. These products will not work. If we're using what's called a pre-emergent herbicide, which is a herbicide you spray on the soil surface, 
it needs, within 10 days of application, it will need some kind of moisture. Either you irrigate or it's got to rain. Otherwise, these products are not activated. And we'll talk more about this. But just to give you an idea that just because it's a herbicide doesn't mean, well, it doesn't matter. We got any weather condition. No, that's not true. Okay? And we have had herbicide failures because the weather conditions were not right when they were applied. Okay? The, where we've done, where there's been tremendous improvement is on retention of the herbicide on the leaf, particularly something like Roundup, where, you know, I remember going up and spraying my field products when I was doing my PhD, and, you know, within half an hour, it was a clear day, within half an hour, these clouds came over and boom, started raining, you know, heavy downpour, washed off the, um, you know, the product, and that's it, it was over. Companies have done a great job. The technology has gotten to the point where basically if you allow, all you need for some of the Roundup products now is half an hour. Half an hour window of no rain after you apply, and it could pour afterwards, and the product is, is, is going to be held, and it's going to be in there. Okay? That's called rain fast. Okay? Rain and fast, F-A-S-T. How rain fast is the product? And we're down to half an hour in, in preview. Jeez. I couldn't remember in the 70s, 24 hours, no rain. And you imagine that living along the lakes here? Every, what's happening in Ithaca, you drive up to Aurora where we have a research station, completely different. Or you're in a, you know, a dry area, you know, cloud shadow or something, and, and you get poured. So for that, it's been, it's, it's been great. But do not think that these extremes are, don't impact herbicides. They do. Okay? And in fact, industry often would have this insurance thing, you know, in the, in the late 90s. I don't know if they do this anymore. Maybe some of you guys might, might be able to tell me. And I remember BSF and Syngenta were doing this where uh, if, if a product failed and it was none of your fault, i.e. it was a weather issue and stuff, they would, you know, provide the, 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 the if you needed to respray the product free and also, you know, whoever was at applying it if it wasn't you. They lost a lot of money because late in the in late 90s, we had a 99 was a really bad drought year in this area, if you guys might remember. 99 was pretty bad. And I, don't, I remember I was in Canada how much some of these companies were paying. You know, all, pretty well the northeast and eastern Canada was just in this drought period, and just at the time when the herbicides were being sprayed. These companies were losing a lot of money. I had a couple of students that were working for industry at the time, and they were saying, man, I'm running around to these, these growers to, to pay off this, you know, to spray again because they didn't work. And they... To tell you, the year after, these companies didn't do that any longer. Just, just, they lost a lot of money. But that's, they wanted, you know, people to, to, to buy their products. I mean, it's, it's industry. Health issues. This is big time. Big issues. As much as I said, you know, herbicides don't cause anything. Hey, they're chemicals. And uh, we, you know, they might be safe in terms of like what we call acute toxicity. You know, you get it on your skin, you might not die right now. But what happens to a, a, a custom applicator or a farmer that's been spraying for 30 years, the stuff, and doesn't take the proper precautions. We don't know what the chronic effects of some of these, and just now we're starting to get a grasp, okay? And certainly for livestock. So that's still a big one, and, and it drives often, you know, the EPA and so forth um, drives some of this, okay? Uh, and again, this public perception is usually you tell people about herbicides, let's face it, in urban, suburban areas, and they say, no, most people, ah, oh, no, no, we don't want any of that. Okay, um, so you know, I'm not saying I want to change your perception, but it's pretty tough. The way ag is being produced right now, or the kind of in ag we do, to, to basically you know ban all herbicides. I am certainly personally in favor of in in landscapes or the home. I have I know there's some folks that'll get upset because I always there's no need for us having to spray to have these perfect lawns. That's just my view. In ag at this stage. Until we have better ways of doing it and, and, and help the growers, you know, move away from what we call the pesticide thread mill where, you know, you just have to, you have to keep going and you've got to stay in business. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I see that still where there's, there's use for it. That's not to say we can't look at alternatives or IPM, but, but there's just one, you know, the, all of this is extremely important. It's what's, why the perception of pesticides in general is negative because of some of these. And it happens. You start finding it in your, in your, you know, water, and now you can detect stuff. I mean, you get, you get, I saw the list of, of uh, pesticides, even in Cayuga Lake, that come off some of these farms. I mean, in just urban areas, it's scary. You know, so be aware of that. And we'll talk more about environmental issues and what that means. But off-target spray drift, leaching to groundwater, that's why a lot of herbicides, if you're from Long Island, are actually banned. Or you can't use as much because it's on a sandbar. 
and stuff just goes right out and ends up in your water table. So that's, that's very, very important, okay? Um, limitations, lack of herbicide resonations in minor crops. You know, we talked about carrots and, and some of these, these vegetables that usually are not grown over large acreages. Companies, chemical companies, are very often not interested in developing products, herbicides, for these kinds of, of crops because there isn't much money to be made. It's low acreage, although it may be high value, it's just not worth it for them. Although there is a program that the federal government supports that's called the IR4, Minor Crop Use Program, where basically research, the government takes the responsibility of testing some of these products that the companies have developed, but the company doesn't want to de you know, develop it further. They've got it in another crop. So say they, they, they have pendimethalin or prowl that they're using in corn, but somebody says, boy, I, I bet you this would work well in uh, carrots, let's just say. So what would happen, the company says, I'm not interested in, you know, there's in the market for us, it's too small, you know, it's not worth our while. The federal government, will this IRR4 program will take that and contract researchers across the Northeast, say, Robin Belinder or Russon, Robin Belinder here at Cornell and Hort, to test these products, do the same testing, see how safe they are and so forth. If the products are efficacious, safe in that crop, then the federal government will register that herbicide, Prowl, under the minor, okay, kind of minor use, okay, umbrella, and i.e. make it legal for the farmers, the, you, the, the growers of those crops, to use the product safely. If there should be an issue that happens, i.e. some crops are killed or whatever, the company is, will not be blamed. It's not because it's kind of saying you could use it, but you're going to take all the responsibility in that crop. But the federal government assumes any, you know, litigation and so forth. Okay? But it's a nice way to get some products, i.e., the federal government is doing it for the public good and for the small growers or those growers that are growing specialty crops that, you know, the companies are not interested. They're not growing corn over, you know, 100 million acres or 70 million acres. They might be very, very restricted or niche markets, you know, ethnic vegetables, for example, or something. So there is that. So be aware of that. But still, that is not, okay, we don't have that much of it. It's, it's, it's there, but it's not as... Well, it's, I guess it's, it's not in use as much as we'd like to see. And, of course, you've mentioned this whole herbicide resistance development. Uh, we are up to worldwide, I believe, 300 species that have shown resistance to one or more herbicides. And I'll show you there's this um, website that is it's current. I mean, it's right there right now. You could actually see, and I'll show you some of the figures um, on, on the, how fast these things are increased, especially to Roundup because we're using so much of it, okay? And, of course... Limitations is when you have products that are so good, okay, and that's what's happened over the last 50 years, okay, until we hit the wall with resistance, fuel costs, uh, because herbicides, you know, you need to develop them. There's, there's, there's a lot, you know, you talk about carbon footprints, there's a lot that's in there to get these, these products, okay. It's, it's basically moved us away from developing sustainable. Because, oh, why should I do it? Hey, I can, for $10 an acre, $20 an acre, I can do that. Why should I worry about complicated things, rotating crops, moving this here? Simple, okay? Well, now we're running. So we've lost expertise. Some of our growers used to be excellent folks at cultivation. Okay, in fact, Cornell, remember Cornell, used to, the engineering school here, okay, department used to have a, you know, machinery court. Gone. It's since 20, 20 years now, almost, at least 15 years. We just brought it back because of a renewed interest in machinery and how important that is if we're going to start running into, you know, herbicide resistance. I'm not saying herbicides are going to go by the wayside, but we need to have more in our, in our arsenal than herbicides. Right now, 95% of our ag depends on, and we're in the hands of very few companies, let's face it, who in many cases own the seed that you need to, you know. So there's this whole kind of freedom to farm idea and industrial ag that comes into it. We're going to focus on the, you know, the science of herbicides, how they work, but you need to think broader about the bigger issues, and it's not the place to do it, but understand why that's, some people are, are thinking, this is not the way to do it. We've forgotten what some of the other things, and now we're going back to literature of the 30s before the herbicide to understand how did people manage weeds. It wasn't easy, okay? It's been too easy in some ways, just like food prices in the United States. Food prices in the United States are, are you know, you might say it's a lot, it's, it's nothing compared based on your income to other countries, including European countries, that pay usually 25, 30% of their income goes to food, whereas in the U.S. it's 10%, no more than that. 
So we, we're used to plentiful, cheap food. And so there's issues there that people talk about. This is the same kind of thing. A lot more, you know, you can get really into kind of the socio, economic, political issues. But just recognize that, that and why there, there, isn't, there wasn't as much money. I used to work in biological control. They didn't get much money in there. Organic, people had to fight the USDA to put some money in organic agriculture research. Its mindset was very, very different just, just now. And again, it's not going to solve all the ills and, you know, let's get, do away with herbicides. I think herbicides are an extremely important component of IPM. But it should not be our first tactic. We shouldn't be thinking. It should be the last resort if we do everything ahead of you know, follow the rules. It's, we're stuck just like organic growers. It's the rescue treatment. But we never think of it that way. We, it, herbicides are the first thing that most of our conventional growers just spray. I mean, don't worry about it. Again, just, just saying. And I, I threw this in because I thought it was kind of cool. Okay? For those of you guys who are your working eye. So, okay, man, you might be dying, but uh, at least you're weed free, buddy. That's, I, so, if any of you see kind of like weed related comic strips, just send them to me. I love to see those. I, I, and then I send them to Robin Belinda over in her culture. She's got a great collection. At some point, I hope she puts it all together for us. But if you see some of that. Okay. So, Having said that, let me just kind of situate you in terms of the development, okay, of herbicides per se, okay? So, of, now some of these you might say, herbicide, I thought you'd meant, you talked about 1940s being when it started. Right, that's what we call synthetic herbicides, you know, organic, carbon backbone, synthesized. But folks were using, including the Romans and the Greeks, were using already what we would consider herbicides, okay? And as I mentioned in the, in the handout here, okay, if you break the word herbicide, what does herba mean? Plant, right? Okay, and side, the, the Latin for it means to kill, sedere, cadere. And in Italian, cadere means to fall. You know, if somebody falls. In Spanish, anybody know? Is it similar? Often, you know, Spanish, French, yeah, cadere, you know? So, so very often, right, and so herb, that's what a herbicide is, okay? So, it doesn't have to be necessarily the kind of products we're using now. What were the Romans using? Well, you know, they knew. They were using salts, okay? Smelter sludges, okay? And non-selective compounds for weed control, basically along the pathways where their chariots were going. And if you see these moves, sometimes you're going in the forest. They, you know, they, they, re they realize if you throw salt, just like, why do you think roadsides are devastated by road, you know, by salt? It just kills these plants. But it's not selective, but it does a great job. So that, that was the first form of weed control. If you kind of go back to, to, to what they were using. Very non selective, very toxic. And, you know, smelters from, I mean, you talk about heavy metals in there and stuff. But just recognize, really kind of when things really started to take off, and some of you have heard this, the term Bordeaux mixture in other courses, including IPM, was this mixture of copper sulfate sulfuric acid okay and i have here this is a, i pulled this off the web just to show you the bordeaux it's still widely used very important very important in the grape industry i, I geez my dad we had a vineyard in italy my dad in canada hey you saw is this bordeaux mixture he drives me insane with just sprays the leaves and i say dad it's got copper this thing is you can't use too much of it but he thinks it's the best thing oh and it's natural it's not that's that's what he always tells me it's natural but it really was the first selective herbicide that was discovered, actually, as many of you know, by mistake, right? Okay? Uh, principally used to control diseases. And uh, I remember in IPM, I think John Losey might have said this, that, uh, you know, there were some, some uh, French uh, grape growers that were trying to keep people from eating, picking their grapes. And they, you know, put some of these products there. It was for disease control, but also saying, yeah, you taste this stuff. It's not, you know, you, as a way to keep them off from picking grapes. Uh, off their, their land, and well, one thing they noticed is when this stuff dripped on the ground, okay, it basically killed all the broadleaf weeds, but didn't touch the grasses. And they were, whoa! And so in, in, I think I read the original article, it was like they had a lot of brassicas, a lot of mustards growing to below the grapes, and they realized, boy, this thing is skin, but look, the grasses were okay, and they started using the product, particularly for in wheat. So, in a sense, this was the first selective herbicide. What it was not was organic. It didn't have a carbon. It was an inorganic selective herbicide. So really 2,4-D in, in, in the late 30s we saw the first organic. And when we say organic, remember the basic chem? Carbon. Backbone. Okay? 
So if any of you have taken, how many of you have taken or will take organic chemistry or a go? This, if you're going to be in pesticides, I mean, you, we don't have to do it here. It's not a requirement for the course. But you all will understand more when you see some of the structures or at least you kind of, and I won't ask you to derive structures, and, but just understand that it's all basically organic chemistry. Reactive groups. Now you might go, oh, no, not ergo. That's, this is bad. I don't need that. Uh, but really, that's what it is. So if you've got some strong background, you can understand why some of these products can be selective. Okay? But the kind of things they were using, too, in the 19th, sodium arsenide. I mean, you should see some of the products that were being used. I mean, this stuff is, some of it is potent. It'll kill you. Okay? Uh, dangerous human toxin also result in numerous animal deaths. I have a, a, a newspaper clipping from 19... 15, I wanted to include it in the packet, in Ohio somewhere, where in the newspaper clipping, it was a you know, Friday, uh, they, there was an article mentioning that uh, 30 cows died of, uh, you know, that belonged to uh, Farmer Joe, and they mentioned it, and that uh, near the railroads, the animals, the last they saw, the animals were, were, were eating around there, and it basically they found out that a day before, two days before, the railroad company had sprayed sodium arsenide. And the animals love it. They're attracted to it because it's got a salty taste. And so the animals started browsing and it killed 30. There's no way. This stuff is banned. I mean, you can't, you can't use this. Okay? But just to give you an idea of what was going on in the 20s, sodium chlorate, okay? boron compounds. Okay? First organic herbicide. Not much widely used, mid-30s, something called DNOT. Okay? You, you have a lot of that information in your notes. And again, I wouldn't ask you, give me the order, what, when, you know. But just understand what, what led to this. So uh, 1930s now, mid-30s, okay? People are starting to, hmm, let's, let's try some of these products, okay? Not a, you know, it was an organic herbicide, but it wasn't very selective, okay? So, it's, yes, it's organic, it's got a carbon backbone, but not as selective as we would have liked. This is a key date, 1940s, 2,4-D. This marks basically wheat science as a science, and that's why it's, it's, you know, when you say oh, you're a wheat scientist, you're automatically often, not as much now, pegged, i.e., wheat science equals herbicides. Because the Wheat Science Society of America got its start here. They were, the wheat scientists before this, like folks that studied weeds, what do you think they were? Who were they and where were they? That was different from entomologists and plant pathologists who were always around. You know, he was an entomologist. Plant, they've been around since the 1800s and were doing stuff. They had their own departments like at Cornell. What about wheat science? Where would they likely have been in, in academia? Would you have, where, in what kind of departments would you probably find them? Chemistry? chemistry? No, not really. Botany, botany or agronomy. Yeah, he just got, oh, he knows his plants. I mean, maybe you bought some botany background, but you would have been in agronomy like this department was before crops and soils. But you wouldn't have been, you know, an agronomist was a wheat scientist. He could, he or she, I mean, knew about soils. They were well-rounded, but you didn't have the, the discipline. With the advent of herbicides, then you needed people to read, because these products were starting to come out and people couldn't keep up. Okay? And now it's, you know, understanding the physiology. Now you had really the birth of wheat science as, as a society. And, and so that's why we're still trying to brush that off, because for the last 50 years, and you look at the literature from the, you know, until the 1990s, you know, wheat science journal, I mean, 80% of the articles were on herbicides, physiology, you know, residual activity. And two articles used to be, you know, weed biology. You look at it now, total opposite. Total opposite. Integrated pest management, weed ecology, integrated, you know, versus, you know, there's still some herbicide, but it's usually resistance development and transgenics. Okay, but just to kind of give you a sense. But this is really where the advent of, of uh, modern weed science per se. And, and, and so 2,4-D, which st stands for 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid, I'll, I'll show you what the structure, why it's, it's that. For those of you in organic, have had organic chemistry, you'll know 2,4-dichlor. So there are two chlorines at the 2 and 4 position of this benzene ring. And most herbicides are going to have rings. They're going to be what we call aromatic. Okay? And, and, and I'll say something about that. But why was this thing neat, this herbicide? Again, discovered by, by activity, uh, by mistake, I should say, um, herbicide. So it, it mimics auxins. Naturally occurring auxins, and what do auxins do in plants from your basic plant phys? They're growth regulators. That's what allows things to divide, the cells to divide, and so forth. And so, you know, when you, some of you are working in tissue culture, you know, you've got your little callus, and now you want to build up the, uh, you know, from the leaf to, to a, a mature plant, you usually will use auxins. Indole acetic acid would be one example of an auxin. 
okay? And so what, that's what this thing does. This synthesized chemical mimics auxins. So when you actually apply 2,4-D, and, and it's very selective for broadleaf weeds, okay, the dicots. That's the other neat thing, and, and trying to understand why is that? Why aren't the grasses affected? And what happens is basically these auxins, this, you, you apply this herbicide at the right rates, and basically the plant starts dividing uncontrollably. Cell division just keeps, it's almost like a cancer, just to the point where basically the, the phloem, the xylem, the conductive tissue is clogged. You basically choke. Okay, and, and the, the plant basically chokes off. And that's why you see this bending and twisting because there's usually a division, you know, division occurs more frequently on one side of the, of, the, of the stem than the other side. I mean, just kind of almost like phototropism and geotropism. This is, and so you get this, the plant basically grows to death. It's, it's a sad way to die, but that's by just multiplying and, and then not, not having food. It basically starves, okay? Okay, and this is the first true herbicide that was widely used it has an organic background, okay? And this is, again, part of World War II. What was nice about it? What was it so different from many of the other products that were before it, like DNOC and some of those other inorganics? First, are really organic, selective, okay? None of the other products were really selective, apart from Bordeaux mixture, but it was inorganic, and the amounts you have to put, okay? Very effective. It was systemic. What does systemic mean? moves through, so you apply it to the leaves or to the roots, but it's moved elsewhere, so it's systemic, as opposed to a contact herbicide. A contact herbicide is a herbicide that you apply to whatever location you apply, that's where it does its damage, okay? So a contact herbicide you might want to use, for example, where it's used in agriculture a lot is, let's say you, you you're, and I've used this example before, you're growing potatoes, and you're about to harvest the potatoes, but some of the vines are still green, and you don't want the, the, you know, the harvester to get clogged with the vines and stuff. What you do is you apply a contact herbicide that basically kills those vines, but it is not systemic, i.e., the herbicide is not carried from the leaves where you apply it to the tubers, which is what you're, you're going to eat. Nobody wants that. You don't want to kill that part. So you certainly would not use Roundup you know, to kill vines because they will be transported throughout and go right into the tuber, kill it, which you're going to sell. So... There are reasons why we use some of these herbicides, but systemic, it was nice. You apply it here, it took care of plants that had deep roots, okay? Very, very good. And the low use rates compared to inorganics. I'll show you a table at the end, what, how we, you know, basically herbicides have become, in terms of how the, the rates that we're using have, you know, it's, it's, how many of you know we're in the fluid ounces now per acre? Fluid ounces, we just need, now, some of you say, well, that means they must be really potent. Nah, that's partly true. But I'll show you one figure, pre-1945. Do you know what the use rate was per acre? How many pounds of some of these inorganic compounds, on average, we were using? 14,000 pounds per acre. I have the data there. I mean, it's unbelievable. We're down to 0.25, okay, pounds per acre, active ingredient. I mean, it's unbelievable. And safety, too. The safety of the products. So, you know, people complain all these herbicides. Oh, they're dangerous. You should have seen the stuff that was being used before. During the good old days. During the good old days, we were using some of the worst products. Okay? And we didn't know it until, you know, cattle died and so forth. So, if anybody gives you this thing, oh, yeah, well, in the old days, you know, we were using safer products. That is not true. Okay? That's, that's one of those things that I will show you that is not true. Okay? that you, you need to be aware, and I'll show you that by, by a table at the end. Hopefully, I'll be able to get to it, okay? You have like three pages of this stuff. This was just to give you an idea of how the products came in, okay, how they were developed. You don't have to know. Some of these you will know. It's going to be our 15, 20 key herbicides, but just showing you kind of the chronology of development of various herbicides. Uh, just wanted to point this thing out. Selective herbicide 2,4-D and something called 2,4-5-T brush killer. This thing was late. Some of you have heard of Orange, okay, Agent Orange that was used in Vietnam. There was a lot of controversy sprayed because it caused cancer. And some information came out where we now know where the U.S. Army actually sprayed. It was used as a defoliant. You're wondering, you know, why they're using it. Uh, U.S. Army was flying over, over, you know, very dense forests in Vietnam. I mean, it's tropical. And you couldn't spot these gorilla, you know, the gorilla-type warfare. And so they sprayed they, to basically defoliate. Remember, this is broadleaf weed control. 
But a lot of villagers and people that lived there got sprayed with the stuff. And now we didn't know in the, in the past where these were sprayed and how much. It was top secret. But just two years ago, the U.S. government released that kind of information. It was enough years that it became public. And researchers went in, and, and, and the, uh, the Army kept such great data on where they applied, what and when. And so then the researchers matched that with the incidence of cancer in these villages over the 50, 50 years or so now, I mean 50 years, 20, 30 years or so. And boy, there's a close correlation between cancer, um, incidence of cancer in these villages and people and death and, and so forth. So, uh, you know, these products, and it was banned too, yes. Exactly. Was being, was, it couldn't, at that time, it right. Right. And that's and that's actually a good point. I was going to make that point now that part of the problem was in the manufacturing of the so the two four five T per se wasn't really the problem. Is this this um, byproduct called dioxin that's really a well known carcinogen, and that was right. They couldn't be separate. And that was sprayed. Together now that that has been banned. I mean, basically, yeah, two, four, five. You, you can't, you won't be able to use them because of that dioxin. And some of that, if some of you remember, or maybe some of the folks a little older, Love Canal and Niagara, that, there was the issues that stuff was was leaking, leaching out into into the Niagara River. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of, you know, and that you know, so some of these products we know are carcinogen. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's just, you know, we were using without really understanding. But it wasn't the herbicide itself. Now, there have been some issues with 2,4-D. There, people are, are concerned in that particular landscapes areas, which is a big herbicide used, it's used both in ag, but also in landscapes, turf grass. It's one of the mixes that they include in there, uh, particularly for young children. You know, you're spraying, you know, weed man comes in, they spray, and the kid, usually, you know, now they've got to post it, but, you know, you got your dogs, your little kids in there. There is concern that this does have carcinogenic properties and I can show you articles that support it, others that don't, and you know, kind of think the jury's still out. But anytime I see that kind of stuff, I'm cautious. That's that's all I would say. I would use this in a cautious way, take the proper um, you know, dress appropriately. When I see a grower, you know, no shirt, it's when and they're spraying and I could smell the stuff. You know, I drive I usually, you know, I'll stop and usually I go talk to them. So you know that is first of all you're not a good example for, for folks. And your health, just having this stuff flying around you with no shirt because it's 90 degrees. You shouldn't even be spraying it's 95. Well, you know, the guy was telling me, well, you know, I, this is the only time I have to do it. Okay, but look at your neighbors, and you've got these little kids running around. Anyway, yeah, he kind of, ah, you Cornell guys. But I say, hey, no, I've worked enough with industry to know that you've got to be, you know, you've got to be careful. Take the precautions. Dress properly. Do it when it's, if done properly, most of the problems tend to be because people are not following the rules. That's, that's the issue. Yeah, Austin. Yes, yeah, DDT for malaria control and stuff. Right. The scary thing is, unfortunately, a lot of these products, none, these are not banned in the U.S., 2,4-D, but some of the products that have been banned in developed countries, unfortunately, get shipped off to, to developing countries, which creates obvious, obvious problems. And if you think our application techniques, you know, are sometimes substandard, not all the time, you know, uh, you go to some of these guys, I mean, you basically, and some of you have been over, over, overseas, and Robin Belinder has got this, showed me some, I mean, these guys are just, this is how they're spraying, you know, the herbicide. I mean, they're just some nasty stuff, insecticide, just like this with a magic wand and no, you know, and you go, wow, this is, no, no, this is not good, okay? So, but it's amazing though, you know, and, and you'll see in terms of safety, some of these products, you know, really, really, there's been tremendous improvement, but this is the kind of the glory years, you know, the 50s, 60s, okay? I don't have this graph here. But then in terms of discovery of new herbicides, okay, just goes up to the 80s. But I just want to show you this. So 40s, 50s, 60s, late 60s, discovery of new herbicides starts dropping. And, and basically has leveled off in, in the 80s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, where we get maybe one or two new molecules, new chemistries, or new products, novel products not mixes of old products into a new, because that you'll have tons, but new chemistry that would, would go under here. For example, something, for those of you who know, like Callisto, Mesotrione in 2003 or 2002 was a new product. New, it affected plants in a different way. None of the other 
chemicals have that mode of action. Okay? Just to tell you, we're getting one, two at the most new chemistries coming in. Does anybody know why we, you know, so, so if I were to draw this for you guys, okay? So, so if this is the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and, you know, about here. So, it, you know, just it kind of started. Okay. So this is timeline. This is number of novel chemistry or novel molecules. What happened here? Yeah, I know some of you obviously weren't born, but what's, what's the big thing? Ben. No, they were still they were still doing stuff, Megan. Rachel Clark and Silent Spring. The uh, the whole environmental movement. There were starting to be issues related to that. That was one. That was starting to be to be an issue, but it wasn't. There was there wasn't the main one. What, anything else? There was there you know energy. The late early seventies, mid seventies. There was big energy issues, just like we had gone through. There was a. That also played a role. What's happening in the late 60s, mid to late 60s? Think about outside of herbicides and Vietnam War. Vietnam War. There's this whole movement, just like, you know, this last election. There's, you know, this, these are defining moments. You're kind of looking, boy, something really happened. What happened? Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, 62 starts coming out. There's this whole movement, uh, you know, backlash against, you know, industrial ag, pesticides, you know, that this is poisoning. I mean, part of that. Uh, energy issues, the Vietnam War, a lot of that, you know, and there was a lot of starting to be back. First incidences of resistance, 1968, to atrazine, okay, in this country. Uh, Common ground zone in Washington State was one, okay. Now, there's, I don't know what the numbers are, and it just dropped. But also what was played a role was, yeah, the number of products that were on the market, but also cost. It was very costly, and if now... What also happened in 1970, I think it was one or 72, from an environmental perspective, this kind of, EPA was created. EPA was created. And so now industry was like, oh, man, we've got to put these products through these guys. And uh, that's, you know, unless we're going to make some money on this product, because, you know, they were starting to be, you know, putting some, some, some limitations on the kind of products you could put out there. You needed to do text, text, uh, Testing, toxicity, a whole bunch of, of things. So that also played a role, okay, to the point where we're at now. And now with the consolidation of the agrochemical industry where you have five, six main players, the little guys have been bought out, seed companies have, it's, you know, and the, the monies have moved basically from herbicide discovery or insecticide discovery to where? Transgenic. Now they're looking at, not even just from a you know, control, pest control, but they're looking at improving uh, vitamin, nutritional quality of the products uh, to tolerate biotic, drought stress. So this is where the money has gone. These companies have invested, divested from control, you know, although that's still very important, but more to these other trades. And that's why these agrochemical companies went, you know, a lot of them had, you know, some went belly up, others got bought out. Pioneer was bought out by DuPont, DeKalb, and so far all these companies now are, you know, it's five or six key, you know? So, but still very important, okay? And so this is something to keep in mind, but really that, that movement, and that's still a bit of a, a, bit of a backlash that, that's there, okay? Uh, just want to show you in a very simple way. I know you probably don't see this very well. I had it on, I photocopied it off um, the textbook. Okay, uh, but what I wanted to show you, and again, in, I will not ask you to, uh, to tell me, you know, what the structure of 2,4-D, it's nice for you guys to, to recognize it, but 2,4-D is an acid, okay? It's called 2,4-dichloromphenoxyacidic uh, acid. The reason it's a 2,4, look, this is, there are six carbons. This, this ring here, six carbon ring, that's called benzene ring. It's an aromatic, okay? compound, aromatic having, what's the, so aromatic is ring, what's the opposite, if it's branched, what do you call that? Do you remember base, organic chemistry? So aromatic has the ring, because I'll say something like, this herbicide affects aromatic structure, or it affects only, you know, uh, the amino acids that look like this. The other branched, 
okay, that don't have the ring, that's referred to as aliphatic. These are branch, branched, okay, they don't have the ring, um, typically amino acids or compounds. But these, many of our herbicides are what we call, have benzene rings, these six carbon rings, usually, okay, uh, that basically, in this case, so this is carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four. So you notice that the chlorine is in the two and four position. That's why it's two, four, di, means two, chloro, phenoxy, the phenoxy component is here, acetic acid. So 2,4-D is an acid, okay? We do not use 2,4-D as an acid. It is not available as an acid. Does anybody know why? Okay. Typical formulation, there's a blank here. Stability in water, okay. Solubility in water, there's no solubility. You can't, you, you can't use it. So companies formulate 2,4-D, they combine it with salts, okay? Okay, so you could have a salt. This is a dimethylanamine salt. So an acid and a salt, okay, you, can, you, you get them together, very stable, very soluble in, in water, okay, not in oil, okay. Volatility, none. That's good. You don't want stuff that's volatile because it'll just take off, okay. And what you have here is this is how it's typically formulated. Stability in hard water, fair, okay. What does that mean, fair or poor? You know, it's actually poor for sodium, you know, salts and so forth. What's hard water? It has a high mineral content. Yeah, so calcium, magnesium. So what happens when you use hard water? That's why we have to tell our growers, if you're living in, our, in a place that's got hard water, uh, be careful when you're using 2,4-D amines, which is the most commonly used. It's the safest. Or you, you basically get the, your product disassociating with the, you know, the, cal the, uh, the potassium and sodium come off and the magnesium calcium, which is in high amounts, high concentrate, takes over and the product doesn't behave in the same way and basically precipitates and clogs your, you know, and then it just doesn't work, okay? So, but this is, this is the most widely used form, okay? None of you, well, maybe some of you are certified, but I couldn't go, or, or some of you, let's say, couldn't go and just buy what we call the ester, the ester form. The ester form is the alcohol, okay? It's basically an alcohol form of the 2,4-D. So 2,4-D can either be, okay, a salt combined with a salt, so the acid and the salt, or you combine it, the acid and an alcohol, and that is referred to as an ester. And esters could be really long, okay? A lot of OHs and Cs, okay? The longer, the shorter the chain, the branch chain, the more volatile, the more volatile, okay? The longer the chain, the safer the product, the ester form. Just so you know, the ester forms, you can only spray them if you're certified and you need special per permit to do it. The reason why is that it's tremendously volatile, but what it is, is it is really, okay? Efficacy is really good, okay? This, these products are really good, but you can't be going around spraying this stuff. Yes? We had a, a grower next to our vineyards once who came and got, he sprayed esters, uh, high vowel esters, 2,4-D on, I don't remember what he was growing, but um, he sprayed it and it, it volatilized, obviously, and, and went over onto our grapes and just, just what? curled, yeah, curled right them. them. So I mean, they, li they survived. But oh yeah, but you know the yield track. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean this is. I've been. I told you I've been in court cases in as an expert witness with these kinds of cases, especially with the 2,4-D groups. It's usually a neighbor or a chemlon spraying, and the neighbor's lilac, you know, get wiped out. And the first thing I need to, you know, identify yes is this caused by 2,4-D, and then I start asking what did they use? Did you use the ester form? Okay, what 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 kind of ester did you use? You know, long and so. This is real, man. This is not, you know, this is not a dope in a sense because it's money and it's a serious issue. But the people love this, the, the ester forms, because there's a lot more fit. You know, they really work well. And uh, you often can, um, you know, in this case, they, they work well in oil and so forth. But they're not, obviously, because they're alcohol, not very soluble in water. You wouldn't use them. So most of us, 2,4-D, we use these. But you need to be careful because of, uh, it's safe. 
volat volatility wise, but watch it if you have hard water. Okay? So if somebody says I'm using 2,4-D, the take home message here is you never, you can't use the acid form. It's just not available. You, know, you can't formulate, but you can combine it with others. But what's actually doing the damage is the acid. It's not this other salt that comes along. That, that, that's not the active ingredient. That's why we have to calculate the acid equivalent. What's the acid? So I don't know if, if we talked a little bit about it in lab or if, if uh, Stephanie did, but clearly the acid component, this, this larger chain, the molecular weight of it is a hell of a lot more than the molecular weight of this thing. But so when you do an acid equivalent, you're trying to figure out the acid form. What proportion of this whole molecular weight is due to the acid? Okay, so the you know the the longer it is, the bigger it is. They probably your acid equivalent is smaller. That's why it's less volatile. You know the acid is is, is you know diluted out by this long chain. You know carbon and so forth. And in a sense, you could think it's diluted out. It's not as potent. Whereas you have this short branched you know product. You you can calculate you know molecular weight of this. It's the acid equivalent is a big portion of that whole molecular, right? i.e., it's going to be a problem. Okay? So let me just, since we're going to end, I'm going to, and I'll continue next class, but I wanted to show you. Remember, I talked about the safety of these products? I'm almost there. If you want to just know, I, I know it doesn't come out on here, you know, obviously it's black and white, but I wanted to show you where are most of the herbicides used. It's 2000, 2000. Oh, it came out. All right. Cool. Wow. Hey, look at New York State. We're in the green, we're, we're pretty good. It's where Kyle comes from, those guys in the Midwest, the corn and soybean belt. Scary guys, but I don't know. But on, on Tuesday, I saw this being, well, this part a little, being a little red and so forth, and people are afraid. But what, yeah, obviously, yeah, I wonder how that matches up. Uh, actually, not too, not too good, because certainly the, the Midwest, Iowa, and so forth. But the idea is, obviously, these are, the, you know, where you're using a lot of, you know, a lot of herbicides. The Northeast tends to be so green. We're in the 930 to 4,570 pound, thousand pounds per, per year. Relatively, relatively safe. This is the last slide. Look at the average rate, and I was trying to get the 98 to 2,000. It has gone down, just so you know. But one thing I want to point out to you. So we've gone from 14,000, okay? Uh, look at the, this is average rate of active pounds per acre that is being used Okay, with herbicides, look at the LD50. LD50 stands for lethal, lethal dose to kill 50% of a test population, usually mice. And it can be applied dermally or it could be ingested, would be a couple of the, the cases. And it's, the unit is in milligrams of the, of the product of the herbicide that's applied per kilogram body weight of the animal. Okay? So obviously we can't this, test this on humans ethically, and there's reasons why, and some people actually disagree with using it on animals as well, but this is the best that we can do. And this is referred to as acute toxicity. The lower the number means you need less product to kill 50% of the animals. So 1625 is, 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 you know, as the numbers increase, the products are getting safer. That's what I'm, at least from an acute toxicity perspective. It means you need 3,971 milligrams of, let's say, glyphosate to kill 50% of your mice over a given period of time, okay? Now, people argue with that because this is acute toxicity. Well, what about if you're exposed to sublethal doses for 30 years? What happens to you, okay? These numbers have gone down, and the last thing I'll tell you is that, unfortunately, very often, we talked about this in lab a couple of weeks back with formulations, sometimes, very often, the active ingredient has, is pretty safe, but when it's formulated, when they bring in the inerts, that's when that LD50 drops, i.e., this becomes more toxic. It's the active, and the active ingredient sometimes is, is safer than because when they formulate, they have to bring in, you know, often it was like petroleum-based inerts, okay? So that caused some issues. All right, guys, I'll, uh, we'll continue this next class.